Hey everybody, Charles for HumbleMechanic.com. Today, I'm gonna to be taking your questions on hot engines, picking a dealership, fuel pumps, and more. This is episode 150 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. All right, in order to get a question on a show like this, email me, charles at HumbleMechanic.com. Put question for Charles in the subject. Also, ask your question at the top, mash the enter button a couple times, then give me the paragraph of the details of your question. That way I can scan the questions and answer them much, much faster. I really do appreciate you guys doing that for me. It helps me answer your questions much, much better. Also, White Wookie is in full effect. Be sure you guys are checking out some of the really cool videos that I got out and be excited about the videos that are coming out on the White Wookie. We are just about ready to pull the engine out. The front end is off. That video will be out later this week. I should have that playlist linked up down below in the description. All right, and before we get into the show, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. Fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. All right, now that we got that wrapped up, let's get into your questions. First one comes from Peter. I own an 08 R32 and my question is, how long after driving a relatively short distance should the engine stay hot to the touch? I notice that even after eight hours, I will open the hood, touch the engine cover and it's still warm and feel the engine block and it's particularly hot. Is this normal in your experience? Peter, that's a great question. So engines can retain heat for what feels like a ridiculously long time. In addition to that, right now we are in summer. So of course, higher ambient temperatures mean higher engine temperatures, even when it's technically in the cold start phase. So could this be a normal thing? Absolutely. Could your GTI or your R32 or your Passat or your Volkswagen or your Ford or whatever kind of car you have be experiencing a problem? Absolutely. A couple of things that we can do. We can make sure our fans are working. That's gonna cool the engine down, obviously quite a bit faster. We may even also experience the cooling fans coming on after we shut the car off. That's completely normal in certain circumstances too. Uh, you know, obviously if they're running for an hour and a half after you shut your car off, we have some kind of problem with the fan, maybe with the ECM, the fan control module, whatever. But having them run for 10 to 15 minutes after shutting the car off is actually considered normal. So how long before your engine should cool off? Well, this really all depends. In that short drive where you full in the throttle and ram it on the car real hard, your engine's probably gonna be hotter than if you know, you're just putting along to the grocery store. So these are things we need to consider. Distance of driving and time of driving do not always correlate directly to engine temperature because I can drive it a very short amount of time and have it way up in the RPM range for that short period of time and you know cause more wear or cause more heat than an engine at lower RPM for a little bit longer of a period of time. Make sure your maintenance is up to date. That's gonna be important too. But on this engine, on, on these newer gen cars, be it Volkswagen or otherwise, they're monitored really, really closely. So if there's any instance of maybe improper warm up or overheating, odds are you're gonna get a check engine light. I haven't put my hand on enough, you know, R32s of that vintage to where I was really looking for an engine staying warm for an extended period of time, but my guess is you probably don't really have anything going on with it. Again, short drives don't always you know, equal lower engine temperatures, so do a cursory look, make sure your fans are coming on, make sure your maintenance is up to date, right? All the basics that we talk about all the time. And I don't wanna say if the check engine light's not on, don't worry about it, because I don't really feel that way, but for that engine to retain some heat, especially when the ambient temperature is high, is really not all that abnormal. So I would keep a close eye on it, but think about what is hot to the touch. You know, this might be worth getting one of those temp guns, you know, with the laser on it and hitting the engine cover to see what it is. If it's 100 degrees and it's 85 degrees out, normal. If it's 300 degrees and it's 85 degrees out and the car sat for three hours, now we have something that might be going on. So these are all things we wanna look at that engine compartment can hold a lot of heat for an extended period of time. So I'm not gonna like super worry about it, but this is something I might wanna keep a pretty close eye on. So Peter, great question, man. Hopefully nothing is wrong with your car. I'd like to think you'd get a check engine light if there were, but you know, this may just be a completely normal case, normal situation. 
or this is something you might want to get checked out. It really all depends on how hot it is after that eight hour period of time. All right, next one comes from Steve. In my town, there are two VW dealers. Dealer A has a great reputation on Google, Yelp, etc., but dealership B, which has historically had a so-so reputation with the locals, has been pushing the point that they have been hiring VW master techs and now have three on staff and claim they are the only three in the area. So, how important should this factor into my quest for quality VW service? Should I stick with the service center with a good rating or the one that seems to have the master text? <laughs> Steve, this is an awesome question. I love this question. So you have two sides. We have a dealership full of master techs. We have a dealership full of great ratings. Which one is better? Well, we don't know. We have to basically test drive both of them. The pros on the master tech side, it's really hard to become a master tech. This is not something everybody can do. It takes a lot of schooling, a lot of training, a lot of hard testing, and a lot of life experience to become a master technician. So that lends a whole ball of group of experience, right? But, but, it's training and testing. It's not real world fixing cars necessarily. Personally, I think you're never gonna get past some of this stuff if you don't have this real world testing, but it is just testing. Now we have the other side. We have the Google side, the Yelp side, the you know, whatever rating, dealer rate or whatever there are. How good is that dealership? Well, these could be customer ratings, right? These could be employee ratings. These could have been paid for ratings. We don't know. We don't know. Where did all these great ratings come from? These could be that this dealership really does kick butt and they're awesome and they earned every one of those ratings too. Let me, let me not forget to discount that because that is a good possibility. So we have the perception versus the perception. The perception of a good dealership because they got good ratings and the perception of a good dealership because they have what may be good technicians. And which one's better? Well, they could both be awesome. They could both suck. They could want, you know, the master tech thing should be, could be better. The dealer uh, rating, you know, dealership with the higher rating could be better. We really don't know. If you have one that you already like, stick with them. But these are only generics, right? Yelp is a review for the dealership or an experience. Master tech is one person. You need to get with the advisor and the technician these are important. The advisor and the technician that you trust, that you like, that you work with well. Just because I like a certain advisor and technician doesn't mean you are. I may have a great relationship with an advisor. You might go to them and go, wow, this guy sucks or this girl sucks. Same thing with a tech. You may have a really great experience with a tech. I may think that tech's a hack and doesn't know what they're talking about. So it, there, there is no, there is no, this is the better one. I would like to believe that if you are a Volkswagen master technician, you are a top level technician. You are best of the best, right? Up here, way up here, way, way, way up here. That may not be the case. I also like to think that if people have gone to the trouble of filling out a Yelp review or a dealer rater review or a Google review, that the place earned it. But I can tell you that that's not always the case on either side. You could have a hack as a master tech you could have a dealership paying to get these really good reviews. You really don't know till you go into the building and feel the vibe. Talk to the technician, talk to the advisor, get it from them, get it right from their mouth. I've shot videos and done videos about how to talk to technicians, how to talk to advisors. I'll try and find that and link it up because I think it's very valuable to get to the people that you're gonna be working with. You know, online, Online only tells you so much. It doesn't tell you exactly how that person feels or what their skill set is. It's only a guide. So check them both out. Go to the master tech and say, hey, I want you to be my technician. Go to the place that has great Google reviews and say, hey, you guys got great Google reviews. I'm gonna give you a shot and pick the one that works better for you. Because again, what works well for me may not work well for you. And if you guys have any advice, any master techs, any techs, any dealers that you love, Post it up in the comments section below. Let us all know because everybody has a bad mechanic story and everybody really needs to have a good mechanic story. All right, next one comes from Simon. I recently replaced the fuel pump on my B5.5 Passat. Now in the mornings when the car sits, it cranks and cranks and cranks and I stop cranking it over 
again and it fires up. Once it fires up, drive smooth and no idle issues. Any suggestions? So Simon, your fuel pump died. Now you replaced it. Now we have a different problem. You need to go back and check your workmanship. Go ahead and pull that pump out. Maybe the pump's not seated all the way. Maybe, you know, on the B5s, it has to go down in the tank and twist and lock. Maybe it's not twisted all the way in. Maybe it's sitting, you know, kind of cattywampus. Maybe one of the accordion lines, like you mentioned, has come off. You got to go back and check your workmanship. We have to look at what kind of Passat this is. Is this a four motion? If it's a four motion, there's multiple senders, multiple level senders in that play into the tank. Maybe we only have one side of the saddle that has fuel in it and the other side's empty. So you need to go back and double check your workmanship before you do anything else. Make sure all the lines are hooked up. Make sure again, that pump is seated and twisted and locked into the tank. Make sure that no hoses popped off, connectors popped off. Make sure your pump is clocked correctly, right? Inside the tank. And odds are you're gonna find that something popped off during the installation. Or you maybe even have a bad fuel pump relay where the pump is not priming. So it's taking that extra key cycle to crank and provide fuel to the engine. Or you know maybe your door latch is bad and when you open the door, it's not priming. This is really one of those problems that you have to experience to properly diagnose. How long is crank, 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 key off, crank start? Is it 40 seconds? Is it four seconds? This is information I don't have. So we need to start with going back and rechecking all the stuff that we did, especially if we didn't have the problem before we put the pump in. I know the pump died, but before the pump died, was this an issue? We also wanna look at the possibility that, you know what, maybe we got a bad pump. Did we buy a cheap quality pump off of, you know, some crazy weird website that, that uh, sells maybe bootleg fuel pumps? I don't know, do we replace the whole unit? Or did we replace just the motor portion, just the electric motor portion? Maybe it's a workmanship issue, maybe it's an install quality issue. These are things you're gonna wanna go back and look at first before you do anything else. So good luck to you. Hey, Simon, when you figure out what's wrong with it, please throw that down in the comments section so that if anyone else runs into that problem, they'll know a really good place to start. All right, next one comes from Denny. My VW Caddy won't start. It shows a transmission error zero zero. 653, key gets stuck, Prindle keeps blinking, was not using the van for some time, it got a dead battery, I charged it, and I got this problem. There was some water in the van due to rain in the driver's side area. Now, Denny, we don't have a caddy in the U.S. anymore. It's been a long time since we had a, a caddy model. So, as far as module placement and the water in the cabin, I don't know. Is something on the driver's side that can be upset because water is in it? Absolutely. The Passats were a really good example. The B5.5, B5 Passats had the convenience module on the driver's side under the carpet, had the transmission computer on the passenger side under the carpet. If the transmission computer got wet, things like this could happen. The transmission could get really mad and that can cause the car not to start. The car doesn't know what gear it's in. So a car modern car with an automatic transmission is only going to start in neutral or in park. There's a switch. It's called the park neutral switch. And that prevents you from starting the vehicle in gear, right? You can do it in a manual transmission, but if you try and do that, it's going to lunge the car forward. Because of the automatic transmission, the car can say, nope, you're not starting this until you're in neutral or park, which is a safe gear to start the vehicle in. So we could have an issue with water intrusion. In fact, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that's probably what's going on. The car sat for that extended period of time. Sure, the battery could be an issue, you know, or a dead battery could be an issue, but my gut says this water intrusion is your key. You're gonna to wanna to find out where some of these modules are in this car. I don't know, I don't have access to that because like I said, we don't have that in the US. But you're gonna to wanna to find out where the transmission computer is. You're gonna to wanna to take a look at the shifter, Maybe the ignition switch is bad, but odds are it's either water intrusion or maybe even a critter or something got in there and chewed it. So visual inspection here is going to be 100% your absolute best friend. Also drop it down into neutral and try and start it, see if it'll start there instead of in park. Maybe something's jammed in the shifter or something like that. I've seen that plenty of time. And uh, you know the key can get stuck in the ignition or you might not be able to start it. So. You're kind of on your own on this one, man. Unfortunately, not having the car in the US makes it rather tricky. But again, 
Water intrusion is the big red flag here, as well as the car sitting. Make sure your wires aren't chewed up and make sure you don't have standing water or water damage in a module that can prevent the vehicle from starting. Transmission computer, you know, gateway. I mean, there's tons of modules that this can happen, but the two biggest ones in the US were TCM and convenience module. So good luck, man. I hope, I really hope, I really, really hope that you get it taken care of. All right, got time for one more. This one comes from Len. When replacing the oil pan with a hybrid oil pan, what sealant do you use? Does it have to cure for 12 hours? And do I need to snag extra bolts from the salvage yard? I'm planning on replacing the oil pan over the holiday weekend on my 01 Golf. After reading a great how-to on VW Vortex, I have a couple of questions. When you replace the pan at the dealership, do you let the sealant cure for 12 hours? No. I let it cure for about the amount of time it takes me from torquing those bolts until I'm done all the way, put the car on the ground and fill it up, which usually works out to be about 30 minutes, give or take, because I'll do some other cleaning as well uh, in that time frame. Obviously, or maybe not obviously, the longer you let that cure, the better, but I've always done them that way, whether it was a Passat, whether it was a hybrid pan, whether it was a metal pan, whether uh, the steel pan, whether it was an aluminum pan, didn't really matter. It always works out to be about 30 minutes from the time of torquing the oil pan, dropping the car, doing all the other stuff, putting oil in it, and firing it up, and I've never had a problem. Can the sealant be applied prior to install, or does it need to be applied, then installed, and then cured? Also, when I did the timing belt, I had an issue with two pulley bolts. Do the pan bolts cause you issues? Thanks for being my DIY consultant. Love the videos. Congrats on five years. Hey, Len, thanks for the well wishes on five years. For those of you that don't know, uh, what day was it? June 20th-ish was about the five-year anniversary. Well, it wasn't about. It was the five-year anniversary of HumbleMechanic.com. So thank you guys all for all the support over the years. I really do appreciate it. The YouTube gig is quite a bit newer. If you don't know, I did a lot of writing early on in the blog. It kind of sucked and it was boring and I got bored of it. So this is way more fun for me. And you guys get to listen and watch me rattle and ramble and try and answer these questions. So uh, as far as the oil pan goes, I don't let it cure for that long. Again, just the amount of time that it takes me to get the car down and wrapped up and oil in it is how long it cures, about 30 minutes. As far as installing the sealant on the pan, don't do it. Don't waste your time. Get it, do it when you're doing it. Make sure everything is clean and you'll be fine. Uh, I use the factory OEM sealant, whether it calls for the white sealant or the black sealant, whatever that car calls for. Your car should call for the white sealant. It stinks, but it works really, really well. You don't need to overdo it. A thin layer is perfect. And just, again, take your time, make sure it's properly torqued. Let it cure for about 30 minutes and you'll, you'll be fine. You won't have an issue to worry about. As far as the bolts, uh, you mentioned about the timing pulley bolts. I have never really had an issue with many of these. I will say the ones that are sort of in the bell housing area can be really tricky. And what I use is a ball end number five Allen. And the best, the best, the only ball end that I really like to use is from Snap-on. You know, a lot of times I tell people, don't buy the Snap-on tools. You don't need to spend the money. Ball and Allens are one place where hands down, no one will ever convince me otherwise, Snap-on is the absolute best. I've used a bunch of other ones and some of them work okay. Some of them will round out an Allen head bolt in a second and some are just absolute, you know, somewhere in between garbage and less crappy garbage, I guess. But the Snap-on ones, I don't know if it's the fit or just the shallowness or the depth, they fit really well, and I've never, ever, ever had an issue. I've used other ones, like s &K is the one that really stands out, and they were terrible. I don't recommend those, but Snap-on, again, if you're going to be working on Volkswagen, a ball number five Allen is an awesome tool. This is one area it's really, really, really worth spending the money, especially because you're working kind of blind on removing this oil pan through the bell housing, these bolts through the bell housing and you're gonna have a hell of a time getting an extractor up there or something like that 
in order to uh, in order to get the bolt out if something bad happens. The ones on the outside, a 10 millimeter socket is perfect. You don't need the ball end, but because you're kind of coming up at an angle, you know, like an awkward angle into the bell housing, I really like the ball allen for this job. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Questions, comments, you know what to do. Hey, if you like the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. I always appreciate that. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at humblemechanic.com. Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, blog, and of course, on Snapchat. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. No drink of the day, because I don't know why. There's just nothing here at all.